Okay, we're gonna bring back, we're gonna bring back Randy Lyle and uh, 32 years in Cal Fire. We don't need to regurgitate all that stuff from before. But what I will tell you is he was the first or second speaker we got on Zoom who said, I'm interested. And when we told him what the subject matter was, I think he started writing his outline right there on the Zoom meeting with us. So I'm very excited to reintroduce Randy Lyle. Thanks, Thomas. Check, check, one, two. Good, good, good. Good to go. Appreciate it. A little quiet. The lavalier. Yeah, we're good. Okay, good. Uh, good to see you again. Thanks. Uh, honest to goodness, you guys, I really am humbled to, to be here. Uh, it's a thrill and a, and a nerve-wracking kind of a thing. And um, this one's for Dino. I told, look, Dino? Huh? Fair enough? Okay, all right. Good. All right, okay. Enough silliness. Um, let's see, where are we going to start? With the glasses. Situational awareness. What's going on around us, right? What's going on? Now, I mean, there's all kinds of different ways to think of situational awareness, and I'll just call it SA uh, a, a lot of the time. Um, but that's kind of a, a little tagline that I like to, to lead in with there. Don't do stupid stuff on bad days, right? And it, it kind of presupposes that you know what stupid stuff is and you know when the bad days are. And so typically I'm working with electric utilities or people that don't want to be in the, in the headlines, at least not for causing fires, right? So that's kind of what this is all about. Uh, and so stupid stuff, cutting, grinding, welding, bad days, red flag, right? Cutting, grinding, welding, a bad, red flag, it just doesn't make sense to do that kind of stuff. Put that kind of work off until it's more of, more of a benign weather day, if you will, a day that, you know, that's a little more conducive to that kind of stuff. Um, so, so we talk about SA, I'll probably call it daily SA, SA, um, and, and as before, I really do welcome questions during the middle of the thing. It, it won't bother me at all. In fact, it may help, right? So don't do stupid stuff on bad days. That guy did a stupid thing on a bad day, right? Uh, something bad happened with that helicopter, and uh, he wasn't paying attention. Now, we're going to talk a bit about this, but this guy had a lot of SA at his disposal. If you've ever seen the cockpit of a helicopter, you know that there's a lot of gauges. There's a lot of instrumentation. There's a lot going on, and, and possibly it was a little bit of overload for the pilot. Um, and so, although he had the SA at his, um, at his disposal right there at his fingertips, he may not have been paying real close attention. And the presumption here, uh, what happened, is that he, he, was, com he was dipping on a fire. He, he came in to dip. And you, you can only have just a, you can only be moving forward just a tiny little bit. Really, you're supposed to come to a halt. The bucket will swing, come back, and then you kind of settle into the dip, they say, and, and, and fill it to whatever you know, capacity, and then take, out, or, or take off and, and lift, if you will. So what happened was he's got a little bit of forward airspeed. He comes in, he drops the bucket in, it grabs the water, it, 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 it pulls the, 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 sh the, the nose of the ship down, right? And then, of course, he yanked on the clutch and it pulled it back. When it came back, the tail rotor hit the surface of the pond and it broke off the tail boom. Um, and then it, it rolled over onto the side. And let's see if we, yeah. So you can see the, the, the tail boom there is all pulled off. It's being uh, lifted out of there uh, by another helicopter. I mean, it was it's one of those things where you, you, know, you see a, I don't know, a Ford or a Mercedes or whatever on the back of a Chevy um, tow truck flatbed thing. You know what I'm saying? I mean, but to, to see a helicopter lifting this other one out, it was noteworthy. Um, this happened right near one of those uh, camps that I had talked about. So this thing walked its way to the, the bank. Um, of the, um, of the pond and, and, and came to rest right there. And it, like I said, it turned on its side and the, the, the main rotor blades are still spinning. It walked its way and it came to rest there. The guy made it out okay. There weren't any big uh, injuries. That was 
almost certainly just one guy. This is back in the mid-90s. Uh, just happened to be close enough for me to get pictures. I mean, I guess the only thing you kind of get out of this picture is even if your helicopter won't fly, you can still do bucket drops with it, right? You can still drop water out of it. So um, that, was, uh, that was kind of a, a, an interesting day. But so when we think about essay, what kind of, um, what kind of essay, what kind of situational awareness did this guy have at his disposal? Well, here's a partial list anyway. Um, he had forward airspeed, which is probably the one that he should have been paying attention to. Heaven only knows how many dips this guy made. Girl, maybe, I don't know, it doesn't matter, don't know. Um, but he or she wasn't paying very close attention that day to the forward airspeed, that would have been it. But he had altitude or AGL above ground level. He also had elevation uh, via a, a barometric altimeter, okay? He had quantity of fuel on board, he knew how much how much the fuel on board weighed, they, they counted in pounds, not gallons. They don't really care how many gallons. Everything that, that, that matters is, uh, is weight, if you will, with these helicopters, especially with the little guys. Um, he had gauges that tell him engine temperature, oil pressure, pounds of torque on the tranny, the whole shot, right? I mean, he's got a lot of stuff going on. He knew the outside air temperature, may have known the humidity. He knew how long the lines were attached to that Bambi bucket. Again, he's, you know, he's dipped and dropped many, many times. He knew how full he could, could uh, pick, uh, how full he could fill the Bambi. So they, they have adjusting straps and you can open and close them to regulate how much water you can fill because it's only got so much lifting capacity. And this is up, I don't know, probably around 3,000 feet or so uh, above sea level. And so the air is a little thinner, so he doesn't have as much lift. Same, everything being the same, he doesn't have as much lift. Um, and so the, the point of all that is he had a variable ton of information and data at his fingertips, but he, he certainly missed something. And then when I think about SA, when I think about SA, we'll, you know, we'll bring it kind of home to the thing that I'm more uh, in tune with. Uh, Lots of information is good or can be good, but it, it, I want to think of, of good information is useful, right? We want, we want useful information. We want useful uh, situational awareness. So um, lots of times I'll, I'll, I'll talk with a utility uh, a client or prospective client, whatever, and we, we talk a lot about SA. It's one of the things my, my little company does. And, um, they jump right out and they say, yeah, we need, to put, we need to put in weather stations because we need to know what the wind speed is and we need to know what the humidity is and what the temperature is. And I said, okay, okay yeah, that's all good. That's good. Uh, good information. Um, why, what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that? What you really want is fire danger. You mean you, you, you want to you get to a place where you're uh, aware of fire danger, not just weather observations, okay, or if you follow what I'm saying, you pick it up, okay, um, because all that stuff, again, is, is, is really good, and if you're going to do a PSPS, right, public safety power shutoff, if you're, if you're, if you've got that kind of weather going on, probably a red flag is declared, red, uh, a PSPS is at the very top end of that, okay, um, and so now we do want to know what wind speed is doing, we want granular wind speed, now we're talking about useful essay, if you follow, you know, the train of thought. Um, so, so there you go. So there's, the, there's that. So we, um, we talked about essay, uh, essay defined. So here we are uh, back in my uh, air attack days. It was one of the things that I really, really wanted to do. You won't see many of those aircraft around anymore. Um, they're, they've been replaced by the, the Marine Corps OV-10 Broncos. Uh, which is a much better aircraft, uh, but they're hard to train in because they've only got two seats. They get a pilot and the air attack officer sit, you know, kind of in tandem like this. Uh, no room for a trainee, right? So they have a handful of these sky masters that push me, pull you. There's a, a, a prop in the back. Um, that's that's actually another propeller in the back here, and they're they're just weird and everything, but. Um, you can sit two aside, you know, two in the front and two in the back, and that way you can, you can fly as a trainer. Um, so, so SA could kind of generally be thought of as uh, knowing what's going on around us, right? What circumstances or conditions exist in a given scenario, um, and what to expect, 
And I think that's important, what to expect, right? Where's this, where's this trend headed? Is it peaked? Is this weather event or this wind event or this fire siege or, you know, fill in the blank? Has it peaked? Is it trending? Is it going to go up? Is it going to get worse? Do I need to pay more? Or is it going to, you know, tail off now? Have we, have we come over the crest and we're, uh, you know, coming down the backside? Kind of, kind of like I talked earlier about um, the difference between a camera in a, a uh, a mountaintop camera, which is good, uh, and a lookout, which is a human with all the background and the ability to think and all. Um, the, the air attack officer provides that say, what's the fire doing, where's it going, what's it going to do, provides that kind of operational kind of fire behavior essay to the people on the ground, okay? He or she also directs the air traffic over the fire and, um, and takes care of all that, so you're kind of the... Um, I don't know, an air traffic controller fighting fire from the sky and all the rest of that, right? Um, so it's a, it's a fairly important position, and that's, that's kind of why I threw that slide in, again, just because I needed something to kind of uh, picture SA, if you will, so I'm, I'm filling that gap with that. Um, so to, to bring it real close to what we care about with, with regard to SA in the uh, wildland fire scenario, okay, how likely is there to be an ignition? Okay, um, so that's kind of, you could think of it as there's, there's a handful of uh, um, values that go into this big long equation. They're, they talk about the, the, the time of the observation, they talk about the wind speed, they talk about the wind gusts, of course there's a difference. They talk about fuel moisture at various sizes. Uh, they, then they, they calculate an ignition component, it means if you threw 100 matches in the grass, how many would light a fire? So it's a, a number over 100. And then they talk about a spread, um, ignition component and spread component, which is kind of an open-ended thing. So the bigger the number, the faster the fire's expected to spread, okay? All of that is, uh, it, it, what, what comes out of some of this um, w observations and the algorithms and then the historic fire uh, occurrence and, and behavior and all that they're, they're crunching daily. And we'll, we'll talk more about that here in a bit. Um, so how likely is there to be an ignition? What kind of fire behavior do we anticipate? Okay. Um, and then, you know, what, what are the burning conditions going to be like? In other words, um, how difficult will they be to suppress? So if we have ignitions here, there, or, or wherever, the area of concern, how difficult might it be to, to suppress? Uh, how much equipment might it take? Okay. What constitutes a reasonable dispatch of equipment to that fire in that location on that day, right? So we're back to some of the stuff I talked about before. Um, and then how large of an area can we realistically track granular SA for? And, and how granular can the information be before it becomes kind of unuseful? So let me give you an example of that. Um, San Diego Gas and Electric Company has one, two, uh, one, two, three, four, seven, let's say seven zones. There's a, a desert zone, a mountain zone, a, 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 a valley zone, and then a couple along the coast, whatever that adds up to. Um, each of those, when I say zones, they're actually, they're operating districts, okay? We would like to be able to split the mountain one uh, into some elevational bands because the SA, the, the conditions can be different at, at 5,000 feet than it is down at 2,000 feet, but the models begin to break down. So we can only be so granular with our, our modeling and our situational awareness um, before, it, before it just breaks down. And they've been banging on that since, uh, I think it's fair to say since about 2009, 2010 maybe, and they, they still haven't broken them down yet. And it, because it, it, not only, it not only has to be good information, but it has to be useful in too much can be too much, too granular uh, can be too granular. So one of the tools that's employed on the ground out there uh, across the nation are, are what, what are known as the National Weather Service fire weather zones, okay? Um, the, the fire weather zones are, in general, there's some uh, exceptions, but in general, they are uh, areas of homogenous fire weather. There's other forecast zones for other forecast purposes. But the fire weather zones are specific to fire weather and then typically real specific to red flag warnings and fire weather watches, okay? So we won't get a red flag for a county, uh, 
uh, except for if it were in certain, certain places, there's a handful of places in Texas, for example, there's probably others, where the fire, the fire weather zone is also a county. And that just tells me that it's so flat and there's just nothing to break it up. So the, the uh, fire weather is homogenous across that whole county. And it looks like a grid. It doesn't look anything like what you would expect uh, a fire weather zone, which would be broken by elevation and you know, geographic features and that kind of stuff. So um, it can be SA, daily SA can be driven by fuel and weather conditions, of course, like we talked. Um, and then I'm going to come back to cameras a wee bit, okay? Uh, no discussion of SA would be complete without mentioning mountaintop cameras. So here we go again. Uh, it's, it's a perfect example to also capture weather information. And I, if, I could, if I could influence anybody to, uh, in any way, uh, it would be, it, let's begin to collect weather information with all this instrumentation that's already out there. We've got, we've got all, the, all the hardware, all the backhaul capability, all the communication uh, ability and all. Let's gather weather from these uh, uh, mountaintop sites as well. Um, so they're virtually everybody's darling right now. The cameras are, are everybody's darling. They, they, they we're able to, to triangulate and pinpoint locations, and I think that that's one of the, the biggest uses for them. There's about 2,000 in use right now. There's potential for lots more, and I think there's utility for a lot more. I think that um, w as we begin to, to install more and more cameras, and then we begin to uh, evolve the AI, artificial intelligence that, you know, that reads what's going on, um, we'll find even more uses for them. It's, it's too new. It's, it's really too new to say it's uh, kind of topped out. Um, I have here that, um, that they have seen or detected fires as far away as 19 miles. Um, I, I know it's actually a little farther than that in some, just because of some conversations I've had since I wrote this not so many days ago in um, some very recent conversations. So that's a good long way. So that's, a, that's a long way for a camera to pick, pick up a visual and then for this AI to, to zoom in and read and say, ah, oh, we're picking up some fire right there. Um, so that's good stuff. And then um, lastly, so this is, this is not a picture of my very first fire truck, but just for fun, I threw this in. This is a 1939 uh, GMC. There were about five or six of them built only. Uh, actually, at a sheet metal shop in San Diego, this one was restored at one of the inmate camps that did um, uh, their uh, vocational program was auto body, okay? And so they, they went, went through and they did the whole thing. I've driven it a few times in parades and stuff like that. It is not fun to drive. Um, it, it doesn't stop well, let's just say. It doesn't go fast, but it doesn't stop well either. Um, so back to SA, just for fun. Back to SA, where do I get this information, okay? Um, where do I get useful SA? So some of it's proprietary, some of it's public information. Um, some of it you just kind of have to make up if, if, if you allow me to you know, describe it a little bit. So this is a picture of the uh, a forecast fire danger class for February 3rd, so just a few days ago, across North America. Each of the little uh, dots there that you can see, so there's a, uh, I mean, you, well, you can see the dots, we're, we're right up in here. Uh, those are one of the remote automated weather stations, RAWs, I'll call them. Um, they, uh, the ROS stations um, push information uh, up to a satellite. The information is tabulated, uh, the data is, is collected, and, and then um, fire danger is calculated out of that. So this is a fire weather forecast. This product is available in the afternoon, ab about two o'clock mountain time uh, daily. Uh, it's a forecast. Uh, good for tomorrow, right? So this would have been good uh, for February 3rd. It would have been pushed at two o'clock in the afternoon on February 2nd. Um, the, the colors go with, uh, with the map. Now, I, I, I probably could have, should have gone back. The problem is, is that these images are not available in, in arrears. And I don't know why they, why they don't make, I mean, this is really good. Uh, good information here. I don't know why they don't make that available. Uh, I've struggled to, to find it, but here's uh, low, moderate, high, very high extreme, and then water. Um, so you can see this is not, not a real big day. There's a little 
a little yellow, a little high down here, a little bit here, a little bit here. And it changes every day. It's very sensitive, very sensitive. And, and what, what we do for the utility, uh, or utilities, is we, we take these five and we crunch them down into three. Uh, I don't call them fire danger classes. I call them operating conditions. And um, we, 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 we build rules about don't cut, grind, weld, that kind of thing, back to that, on, on bad days. And so normal, elevated, extreme, you can do it here. You've got to be careful here. You can't do it here. You, you get the idea. It's pretty straightforward. And uh, it's just very simple, easily interpreted, and there you go. So um, publicly available essay is, uh, is a, co a collaboration between the Forest Service uh, excuse me, the, the weather service, uh, weather service, and the fire agencies. Typically, the feds, the federal agencies, Forest Service, BLM, National Park Service. Um, the National Weather Service actually issues the the forecasts and the warnings. So they they push all kinds of warnings, uh, and, and you've probably seen them for high wind watch, fire weather watch, uh, freeze warning. Um, excessive heat warning and tsunamis, right? We talked about that a bit ago. Um, Paul did this morning. You know, that kind of thing. Um, all of that's good information for utilities uh, and, and other industries, certainly. Uh, it's not all necessarily, you know, going to affect you. And then the fire agencies play into the picture as well. Used to be, in, in California anyway, that the uh, California Department of Forestry at its regional offices, there were just a couple, uh, they f did the red flag warning issuance, okay? And red flag warning back in the day meant that the fire trucks, uh, no kidding, they, they put a, a, a red flag on the antenna and they drove around and they looked for fires and they kind of, you know, let people know, hey, it's a red flag day, it's a red flag kind of day. Uh, the National Weather Service took that back from the fire agencies, and um, now, now it's pushed. And, and one of the things we're working on uh, here locally is getting that information. We, uh, a, a freeze warning and a high wind warning and excessive heat and all that, very important stuff. It's not going to put you into uh, bankruptcy because you started a fire. Red flag warning will put you into bankruptcy by starting a fire. So we, we, wanna, we want proof positive. We want 100% assurance that we have everybody in the field and everybody that's you know, pushing buttons and pulling switches and, and, and using levers and all to move electricity around, turning it on and off, if you will, um, knows that it's a red flag because it's going to affect the way they do business. Okay. Uh, let's see. There's, uh, okay, so the, the information, so the observation, so I, I, I said that they calculate fire danger once a day at 2 o'clock mountain time. Um, they're actually gathering information uh, once an hour. It pushes information. So each of these black dots sends information, a, a variety of things, as I mentioned, uh, once an hour. So with 2,400 of them times 24 days uh, times however many attributes it is, how many values are actually pushing, uh, you can see there's a lot of data. So this is a big data uh, in a big event. Uh, and, and so all of that gets crunched into uh, a collected into a system called WIMS. I, I know you're going to kill me for the acronyms. Weather Information Management System, WIMS. And then out of WIMS, the National Fire Danger Rating System, NFDRS, calculates the fire indices. And those are the indices that are used by the agencies to set dispatch levels, uh, staffing levels, staffing hours, allocate budgets, uh, do road, road area closures, I should say, uh, road closures and, and things of that nature. So it's coming right out of this same system. Okay, so this is situational awareness that, that we're using uh, at the utilities. Uh, another kind of essay uh, is the proprietary stuff. Okay, so it's the stuff that the utilities are creating on their own. Um, San Diego Gas and Electric, Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, Southern California Edison, the big three. IOUs, in, uh, investor-owned utilities in California, they've got millions of dollars to throw at this stuff, and they kind of got shamed into it because they, they weren't paying real close attention. Uh, and um, so they've come up with their own, each, each their own fire potential index. Okay, they call it the FPI. 
and it's basically, it's in general terms, it's a, a, an equation that uh, comes up to uh, a certain value. It, it adds up to 17, so if you, if you take the, uh, the value of the grasses, the value of the uh, grasses, greenness of the grasses or cured, cured state of the grasses, live fuel moistures, dead fuel moistures, you, you get a value there, one through five, one through five, one through five, and there must be something else, because you can go all the way up to 17. So 15, 16, 17 are extreme, 12 through 14, are uh, considered elevated, and then below t uh, 12 are uh, normal. So there's that normal elevated extreme like I talked about again. Again, they, they spend millions of dollars every day doing that, and I, I, wanna, I think I've got, well, I do have a slide. I'm not sure where it is. It comes up in a minute or so. Um, so those are the utility-generated ones, but there's lots of utilities. Most utilities across the country are small and municipal-sized um, uh, s s small and medium-sized munis, PUDs, and co-ops. So m municipally owned uh, public utility districts or, or co-ops, and they don't have millions of dollars to spend on anything, let alone something as um, uh, nefarious as SA, if you want. Nefarious is probably not the right word. Something as, as far-flung as situational awareness. So there's a handful of places that can help with that. It's one of the things that, that, that my company does. We call it the DSAT, Daily Situational Awareness Tool. But there's others, uh, others as well. Uh, NG Watch, there's a company called NG Watch that provides a national, uh, natural hazard alerting. Uh, so when there's a red flag. The Tempest Weather Flow, I was talking to somebody here just a bit ago about Tempest Weather Flow um, uh, weather instrumentation and then the great maps and all that they can get. There's another company called DTN. Um, they provide uh, uh, the same kind of service to uh, utility that I work with in, in Colorado, South Dakota, Wyoming. And, then, and we help them uh, sharpen it. They, they did all the weather, the normal weather observation stuff, but they weren't doing any fire danger stuff, okay? And again, I, you know, I reemphasize, knowing what the weather's doing is fine and it's certainly important, but unless you can calculate fire danger out of that, unless you have the, the wherewithal to do that, the wind is blowing and it's hot outside. Okay, that's good, but what are fuel moistures? What's our real fire danger? So DTN, we work with them. They, they came up, they devised their own well, way to, to describe fire danger. And then another company is called Technosova, and they're, they're for the, the big boys are the ones that have a lot of money. Uh, but uh, no offense to Technosova, I'm just saying. Um, so, so uh, how is this information used, right? Um, so here we go. I mean, th you know, uh, it was uh, Leonardo da Vinci said that the ultimate simplicity is the ultimate in sophistication, right? I kind of like that. I mean, I really do. I, I get it. I don't like clogging and cluttering and everything. So, so the Smokey the Bear sign with the Smokey shovel, uh, what does Smokey say? Lomar High Bear Extreme. Okay. Um, that's maybe too many even for the utility. I like to go down to three, and, and, and here's why. If, if I'm going if, if to say we need to do something, uh, you know, right here, or maybe, maybe, maybe low means it's just normal stuff. The normal stuff that we do every day is thought to be adequate. So I add a shovel to the mix. Uh, sorry. I add a shovel to the mix when it's, uh, when it's a moderate day. Okay, so now I'm doing everything normal, plus I'm grabbing a shovel. Well, when I go to high, what do I do? Two, two, two shovels, right? Um, and if I go to very high, do I use two big shovels? You get the, I mean, it just needs to be this natural progression. So we crunch them down into three and, um, and, and, and consider them normal to me means day-to-day uh, -day business is adequate. Normal precautions are adequate, if that makes sense, to, to pre, you know, prevent ignition and, and escape uh, the, the potential for a big fire. Elevated means you need to pay attention, okay? Go ahead and do everything you need to do, but pay attention. You might need to take some mitigations. Maybe it is a couple shovels. Maybe it's a back pump. Maybe, you know, um, welding blanket or you spray the area with a little bit of a retardant or whatever. It, it, all simple stuff. Simple stuff. And then extreme. Let's not do stupid stuff on these days. Let's just not do stuff that we don't have to do. If it's not essential work, if it's not causing an outage, if it's not causing a, a, a critical outage, let's just wait and not do planned maintenance on extreme days. It just doesn't make sense. 
Um, so, the, well, there you go. I mean, I, yeah, I'm looking at my notes. I just covered all that. That's, that's just about it. Let's see. No driving off-road. Driving's a big deal. I, I've, I've got a, a number of pictures of, of, <laughs> of utility bucket trucks sunk up to their axles in a, in a big burned area. Why? Because they, they got, got, got stuck and they went down and the hot stuff got in contact with the grass. So driving off-road is a really big deal, though it may not seem like it. Everywhere we go, we, we, we preach uh, driving, driving on-road, go for it. Normal elevated extreme, no problem at all. Driving off-road, uh, normal, okay, elevated, pay attention, okay, maybe make some precautions. Be careful where you park. Extreme, re we recommend against doing that. It, unless it's necessary. And if it's necessary, then you need to, to take some precautions. Um, some of the other things that happen uh, during uh, the, the, the upper end, especially extreme, is uh, recloser settings. I don't know if you guys know much about that. I, I'm not an electrical engineer. Uh, basically, when, when the power goes, you guys have seen this at home, when the power goes out, when the circuit opens up, and everybody that talks electricity goes like this with their hands. When the circuit opens up, right, there's a, there's a certain uh, piece of equipment out there that's called a recloser, and it tries to close the, the, the circuit back in, and that's exactly what they do. So it's, it's completing the circuit. So at the upper end, maybe we don't want that circuit to close back in, and allegedly, allegedly, uh, that's what caused a, a 270,000-acre uh, fire in San Diego in 07. It's one of those events I talked about earlier. Um, that the, it, it, was, it, was, it was business as usual for them. It was, it was an apex wind event. I'll show you a picture of that in a sec. Uh, it was an apex wind event, uh, an extremely windy and, and super critical fire day. Um, but it was before we made all these changes to the way we think about things. So back in the day, reliability was king, okay, or queen, whichever again you prefer. Reliability was the driver, and keeping the lights on was the only thing that mattered. So, apex, apex day, apex wind, red flag, the circuit opens up, here I am with my hands, they closed it back in manually, the circuit opened again, closed it back in. The fourth time they closed that baby in, they finally got it to start that fire. Today that would never happen, okay? Would never happen because we don't operate the grid like that anymore. Now, California knows this, other places are learning it, other places, need to learn it. You, you get what I'm saying. It all comes down to SA. It, it, it comes right back down to daily situational awareness. And then the, the, maybe the last thing, next to the last thing on that is patrol requirements. So you, you have a fault, the circuit comes open, can you test it, should you test it, or should you patrol it to make sure that whatever caused that fault and the circuit to open up uh, doesn't still exist. So um, is there a branch gone cross phase, for example, uh, uh, crossing two, two phases or, or two conductors and causing the, the circuit to, to fault is the word they use. Um, can we test it? Should we test it? Should you test it on a red flag dead? You don't know what caused that circuit to open up. Why would you think it would be okay to test it, let alone close it in on a red flag dead? You, you see what I'm saying. So this notion of SA is actually pretty important. So patrol requirements uh, it should come in. And then the last thing, of course, the public safety power shut off. When we get all the way to the very end of that continuum. So if, if this was a red flag, I mean, it's not, of course, but if this was red flag way up here, this tiny little slice right here would be where you'd, where you'd be thinking about red flags, okay? Just this very last tiny little bit right here. The rest of the time, all these other things that we're learning to do uh, including learning about SA um, would keep us out of trouble, okay, if that makes sense. But there comes a time when you got to turn it off. Okay, so let's talk about whether, so that's how the information is used. Any questions so far? Am I going about right? Okay. Uh, weather and fire danger. So you probably all heard of the, of the fire triangle. Who has not heard of the fire triangle? Heat, fuel, and oxygen. Remove one side, move any side, and the fire goes out, right? Is this common? I mean, even outside my, my industry, it's common. It is. You guys know it is. You know it is. You've had fire extinguisher training. I don't care where you work. You almost any place. Um, 
we had the fire square, actually, where I come from. Remember, I said we got along good with the Forest Service. So it's a fire square. Heat, fuel, oxygen, and the Forest Service. Remove any side, and the fire goes out, right? Okay, all right. And, of course, they say that about the CDF guys. But it's, it's all in jest. It's all fun stuff. I mean, you've know, you got to figure out some way to get to them. Uh, and it did. No. <laughs> Partly because it's true, but never mind all that. So weather and fire danger, situational risk. So these are the factors that influence fire behavior, fuel, weather, and topography. When I was brand new, they said the fire would go up the hill 17 times faster than you can. I don't know why it wasn't 16 or 18 or 19. 17 was the number, and they all said that. They must, there must have been a study. How fast can the, the kid run up the hill with a hose pack on his back, and how fast will the fire go up 17 times faster than the kid, right? Um, so, so weather and fire danger, you know, it's like, how is it calculated? What, what adds up to all this, okay? Um, well, live fuel moistures, dead fuel moistures, and we'll talk about each of them. Uh, kind of individually, um, and then, yeah, so th I just got all kinds of stuff here. Um, let me check the time, because we're going to go over parts of the fire. Okay. Live fuel moisture. So, live fuel moisture versus dead fuel moisture, just like it sounds. Live fuel moisture, the stuff that's growing, okay? Grasses are growing, the chaparral's growing, the small herb herbaceous plants, the woody stems and all, they're growing. The timber is growing, it's all live. Um, when the tree dies, it becomes dead fuel moisture, and it, it, uh, it responds to the environment differently. So um, the, um, the light, we'll talk about life for a bit here first. Um, it's dorm typically, it's dormant in the winter, so the grasses don't grow in the winter. The chaparral, which is the you know, predominant where I, where I live and fought fire for most of the time. Um, it's dormant in the winter, but then in late spring, not... Uh, in late spring, it begins to drink. So I'm talking about the chemise and the manzanita and the ceanothus and for, you know, okay, you, you get the idea of the sumac. Um, it begins to drink late in the spring and the, the, the fuel moisture will begin, it'll, be, it'll become dry, uh, it'll become wetter and wetter. And how you calculate it is you actually go out, you clip, this is perfect. You'd clip this little tiny bit. So this was the old growth and this is the new growth. You, you clip a bunch of the new growth. Um, you basically, you weigh it wet. You put it in a can, put the lid on the can. You weigh it wet. You dry it, cook it. You weigh it again and it's going to be you know, lighter. You drove off the moisture. So the, the change over old is a percentage of fuel moisture. So it can run up, uh, live fuel moisture can run up to, well, can run up to couple hundred percent, which means you're, I mean, you really got a soggy kind of a thing there. It's not going to burn. You're, it is not going to burn. Um, and so they calculate that. So for all the species that I mentioned, I mean, the, the trend is about the same. Late spring, it starts to run up. It peaks out. You get the flowering and everything going on. And then it starts to taper off. And, and depending on how, how far down it goes, right, 60% um, uh, is considered critical for most of those species that I mentioned. I mean, give or take. We're just being kind of fast and loose with the facts here with this. But about 60% fuel moisture. When it gets there, fire behavior becomes critical. Okay? And then when it gets to 60%, everybody gets all in a tizzy. Okay, 60%, you know, critical fire behavior, blah, 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 blah. Be careful. And they send out all kinds of bulletins and, the, you know, those alerts with the, the red and white flagging all around the page. So, you know, so you're, you're, you're highlighted to that, that fact and everything. But that's how the live fuel moisture is calculated. And remember, I, I talked about the utilities. They use um, the greenness of the grass, live fuel moisture, and dead fuel moisture. So dead fuel moisture is, is purely, uh, it's, it's whatever it is, whether it's grass, chaparral, uh, this would look like to be dead, although I'm, I'm going to assume it's not, uh, obviously. Uh, no offense. But it could be just by, by its looks, you know what I mean? Um, but it'll come to life. Well, if, if it were dead, this stuff up here is going to dry out really fast. It's going to change to, it's going to, it's going to respond to changes in the environment very, very rapidly, right? So, so here's, by the numbers, here it is. Um, they, they actually, uh, dead fuel moisture is calculated um, by the size of the diameter of the vegetation. So it's one hour fuels, let me go, one hour fuels, 10 hour fuels, 100 hour fuels, and 1,000 hour fuels. Has anybody heard of that at all? Is, is there anybody in here that's heard that kind of stuff? Couple, yeah, okay, okay, fair enough, good, good. 
Thanks. Yeah. Um, so so the, the, the one hour fuels, a quarter inch in diameter, they respond to, 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 to changes in the weather in one hour. That's why they call them one hour fuels. 10 hour fuels are a quarter inch to, to one inch. 100 hour fuels are one to three. And then 1,000 hour, three to eight inch or bigger. And of course, these are seasonal indicators. So when we talk about that, that NFDRS and that WIMS and all those fire danger calculations and all that crazy stuff that goes to, to get us to the Smokey the Bear sign, this is the kind of stuff that's getting crunched into that. And that's, again, that's kind of why I kind of shy away from observations. I want to know the calculations. Um, one super quick fire story. We were out with a prescriptive burn one day by the, the, the female inmate camp where I worked, and I showed you a couple of pictures of. Um, we were burning, and it wouldn't burn, wouldn't burn, and I, 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 there were two or three crews out there, and I, I told my one, uh, my, my partner, I said, send me two hooks and a torch, and I'll send you some fire. So I went down the slope, and I, it, two hooks was two people to, to swing brush hooks, right? So we cut a bunch of dead stuff, we piled it all up in a torch, a drip torch, and I, we, we, it, 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 it wasn't a planned thing. In fact, it was very unplanned. Um, but it just so happened that the live fuel moistures had finally dropped off and they became combustible just about the time all this was going on. So I piled all this up. We put the torch to it. It jumped up and it ran. And they had to move all the buses. And then they had to, they, they actually dispatched aircraft to that fire. Uh, uh, b because it, we got some bonus acres out of the deal. And it just happened to be this uh, one. We had just absorbed this one fire from Ramona. I meant Ramona, Ramona a couple of times. We had uh, just absorbed them, and it was kind of a new battalion chief. And so it was his first burn job. So we, we, we sent him some fire. Anyways, it was kind of fun. But, but that's how critical. So, so the point of that was we had tried all morning long to get this piece to burn. Wouldn't burn, wouldn't burn, wouldn't burn. Same, same scenario, same fuel, same day, same everything, except for that witching hour for that fuel finally dried out, and there it went. Poof, here it comes. Oh, better move them buses. Um, so the readings from the raw stations are combined with uh, the, the National Weather Service forecasts, okay? So we're, we're taking all the readings from all those black dots, and then we're combining them with the forecast. Uh, and there's, there's specific uh, fire weather forecasters uh, at the National Weather Service. Um, so ROS stations, real quick. They're agency-owned, fire agency-owned. They're strictly maintained. They're calibrated. Uh, they're expensive. They're expensive to buy, install, and operate. Okay? Um, they, they do allow the owner to set certain parameters uh, or set certain thresholds with regard to where is the low, moderate, high, very high extreme, right? There's a person assigned to, to do all this stuff. I, I dabbled in it a little bit. I was more interested in chasing fires than learning about that. And now I wish I would have spent more time learning about that because I'm done chasing fires. Um, so the upside, they're reliable. They're defensible. Okay, it's, it's what the, the agencies are using to make decisions on. Uh, they're consistent. Uh, on the downside, they can, they can be not in the best locations because they can't put them wherever they want them. They have to put them where they have property. And that could oftentimes be behind a building or a fence or behind a row of trees or whatever where the Forest Service has a station. Um, and, of course, that's going to mess with the wind. Okay? So, and, and wind, as we talked about before, it was prime. So there's a downside there. Um, in rare instances, they'll go offline in, knows this one firsthand, they'll go offline uh, because of snowfall or tree breakage or whatever, uh, and, and we had a little hole in our daily SA product for a little, so we just substituted a different one. We got the blessing from the agency. Yeah, I would use that one to replace the other until it comes back online. Um, so all of this, uh, we've talked about fuel and weather. Okay, we can't do much about the topography. I mean, we really can't change the shape of the land. We could argue you could do it with enough dozers and earth movers, but not on a landscape level where we're going to change fire. But that's how fire danger is a kind of calculated and a, a kind of an inside look or a, a bit deeper than probably uh, the average uh, bear gets to hear. So um, another slide on this stuff. So this is an SD Genie backcast. I found this online, so I didn't didn't mind using it. Uh, this was the Cedar Fire 2003. So here it is, a, a timeline going back to, to 2002. Here's that fire danger, uh, that FPI. This actually goes up to 18. I don't know why that is. I, I told you 17, and I'm sticking with it. But anyways, this goes up here. But basically, when the FPI, you can see where it peaks. That's when the, So this was a 2002 fire, uh, 2003. Uh, uh, it looks like 2004. I was still working. 
Uh, I, I left right here. I left right here. I, I remember this fire. Uh, the Witch Fire was an SDG&E fire, allegedly. Pendleton Fire may have been one of the ones I showed you. Border Fire, yak, yak, yak. Lilac Fire, if I'm not mistaken, that was the fire I told you about with the Thoroughbred Ranch. Okay? So what, what I'm showing you here is they, they built this FPI. They invested millions of dollars in it. They've got all the supercomputing clusters and all that that goes along with this. And so um, they, they calculate these numbers and these indices and all, uh, and they push it every day, and they do it for those uh, divisions that I told you about. They can't go any finer. Remember that, you know, that talk. Um, but you can see how accurate it is for them. Oh, Gary's done it. Um, it's only when we... What, Randy? Back. It's only when we're up here in these upper levels of 14, 15, 14, some signature of decent fire at 14. And even SDG and &E had trouble. What do we do with the 14 days? We don't want a fourth class, normal, elevated, extreme. We don't want a fourth class in there. It's too many because we just don't have options for what to do. Uh, I mean, we could, we could fake some, but it, it's just green, yellow, red, if you follow what I'm saying. Um, but you can see how, ac anyways, you can see how accurate it is and how useful uh, it could be. Um, let's go ahead and go. Uh, and so that lilac fire is the one that we, we triangulated, 10 days of, of red flags. And you could see, that's a pretty high peak, man. Uh, it was a heck of a day, and we were pretty fortunate. Okay, so wind is king. Here we are on another fire, an extended attack fire almost certainly. Um, so anemometers. Um, Anemometers, uh, the more anemometers, the better. We just don't want to get locked in. SDG needs got a couple hundred of them. A couple hundred, I mean, about two, 200 and some, 210, 11, 12, something like that. Edison and PG&E have got a couple thousand. So, so the state of California is well covered in most of its backcountry and wildland areas. Um, utility weather stations, uh, we, you know, we, we talk about the placement, you know, where should they go? What have we learned about wind? We've learned a lot about wind by having this instrumentation in place, okay? Uh, we've actually learned a lot about wind. So the old paradigm was wind blows uh, fastest at the, at the bottom, in the bottom of the canyon. That's not necessarily true. Uh, and we found that out by this uh, array of, of anemometers that we've got out there on the ground. Um, but the placement density uh, really do affect the kind of information you're going to glean from them, the kind of learning, five-minute warning, and, and what, uh, what ought to be, uh, what, what we can do uh, with that information, right? Um, so we talked about PSPS, we talked about red flags, so wind, wind is king to that. Uh, if the wind is still ramping up and we're already having trouble, if we're having trouble on the system, if we're getting faults and alarms and trips, or if we're getting multiple uncontrolled fires on the landscape, or we come to find out that we're running out of fire resources, right? If, if the fire load is such that the fire, firefighters can't keep up with the fire load that we've got going right now, why would we as a utility think that they're going to be able to catch our ignition? Right, our new ignition. Nah, it's going to be like all the others. There's nothing left to send to it. There's always something, but it may be a ways out. So wind is king. Um, so let me linger there a tiny bit. Let me ask. Um, how about questions so far? Because I'm going to shift. I want to go to that fire slide just for fun. And then I got a couple of questions. Anything so far? What we cover daily? I say. Better feel for it. Do you, do you have a better feel for it? Okay. No questions, the lights are bad. Okay. Um, this is kind of fun. It'll only take a second. So, what, okay, why'd you put this in here? Well, I originally had it in the first one, but uh, parts of a wildfire. Why is this important? Man, if you don't know where you are, if you're working on a fire or you're working around a fire or you're working on a fire that had burned and now you're out doing tree work, on the fire, you're making assessments or, or whatever, okay? I mean, it's not, it's not a real big leap, I, I think. You tell me, but I think it's not a giant leap to think that this could be fairly germane. So here's, here's, the, the, here's this is the famous mint fire, right? Um, fires are always uh, oriented from the point of origin. Um, th this, which th the fire spread is going from here 
to this up here. Which way is the wind blowing? Yeah, just like the wind, just like the arrow. The wind is blowing this way, it's blowing this fiber. So here's the origin. This is always, if, if this were a normal compass setting, north, south, east, and west, if it were, it's not. I'm not saying that. If it were, we would never call this the north flank, nor this the south flank, and we could dance, and that's really the west, and that's, and never mind. that's why we don't do that. Left flank, right flank, head, okay? This is the shoulder up here near the head. Um, this is the black, safest part of the fire. This is the green, hasn't burned yet. Uh, hopefully won't, of course. Um, we would, uh, and then and one that spot fires. So if, if the black were the safest part of the fire um, and we're getting spot fires, it, it tells us that those little fire brands that are, you know, that the fire is, is generating, it's, it's pushing them out there in the wind, it's blowing ahead, and what happens is the embers, will, you know, the the yep. embers. One day, embers are will, will come up in the smoke column and then land and cause new fires. It's kind of a cool thing to watch. It really is if you have the the, the luxury of just kind of just taking the the whole scene in, if you will. Um, it moves me anyway. Um, but what what so they become established. And then they're going to burn in this direction also, but they're also going to burn back this way because this fire is going to pull them. So this is moving this way, this is moving this way, and this head is probably the most dangerous part of the fire. Okay, So contrasted with the black, uh, the head's the most dangerous part of the fire. So one of the admonitions, you know, some, one of those rules to live by, uh, dead ground to de-energize for the electric folks, uh, keep one foot in the burn for the fire folks. Keep one foot in the burn. Always have one foot in the burn and one in the green for a direct attack. If you get too far out in front of it, if you get away from it much at all, you, you, the hairs on the back of your neck need to be standing up. That's not a good scenario. Um, the, the, the firefighting tactics would be to anchor this baby right here um, and then begin to work your way around. Now, uh, all things being equal, which they, they very rarely are not, uh, but all things being equal, this fire right here, you would want to send a crew up this way. This is going to be, they're going to be the lucky ones. Uh, well, I didn't talk about a finger and a pocket, but you, you get the idea. Um, they come around here. You'd also send somebody here. These guys are going to be in the smoke. You can see just because of the wind, the spread and all, right? So this is going to be a little uglier over here. Um, and this is where you'd, you'd want to start a, 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 a um, you'd have an anchor point and then start the aircraft. Very rarely do you want to do anything out here um, everybody tries it once or twice in their career. Everybody fails. So you got a big red spot right in the middle of the big giant burn. What happened there? We know what happened there. He, tried, he went after the head and it didn't work, right? Okay, so uh, I'm almost done. I got a couple of questions, but I want to tell you a, a quick fire story. So I went to a fire one time. Uh, let's pretend like it was it. So there's a hand crew sitting right here. I got a male inmate crew. There's a female inmate crew sitting right here. We'll show them how to fight this fire. This was an, an east wind day. It happened to be a, a power line down day. Okay, it's it end of November 1988. I remember because, and I'll tell you. So, so they're sitting here and said, we're going to show them how this works. So we walked in. So this is a highway. We walked across the, across the green. We got right to here. The, the wind is howling opposite this. So the wind is coming from this direction, blowing pretty much like this. Um, as, we, as we approached, I thought, we'll just go out there. We'll, we'll find a place on, this, on, the, on the edge, and we'll, uh, we'll start cutting line, and we'll go, go to the left, let's just say. Um, the, the flames were about this tall off the stage. It was, just, it was a grass fire. Um, but the wind was pushing the flames down. So the, we're, we, we, we get close to it, and it stands up. The wind kind of quits for a second and lets up. So it stands up, and the flames are eh, not quite to the ceiling here, but, but well on the way, or taller than these, these bushes behind me. So it's like, holy cow, where's the safest part of the fire? In the black, right? In the black. So, so i got to get in the black, because I've got all the people behind me. The whole crew is behind me. So, so I held my breath, and I'm running through the, the, the flaming front and because you, you don't want to suck the, the superheated gas and stuff in. So as I'm traversing this thing, it probably takes maybe two seconds, give or take, something like that. I mean, it didn't take long. Um, I look to the left, and it's just swirling 
orange, like a fog, gaseous thing. And I thought, well, I better just keep going straight. So I bring my gaze, and I look to the right, same thing, and then poof, by the time I kind of get a, a conscious thought, I'm, I'm now out of it. It's, it's behind me. And I can tell that my nose had been burned and my chin had been burned. And uh, they, they flew me to the hospital and stuff. And I don't tell you anything other than it's just kind of a, one of those stories. So, so we have to be careful about uh, uh, the anchor point. So when I got back to work, my boss had a few words for me, right? Uh, because I didn't do it quite right. But I learned on that one. It was, a, it was actually a real cheap lesson. So um, my last slide here, I'll, of course, I'll put the, the code thing up. Situational awareness. Uh, went through it fast. There's a lot to cover. Um, oh, look, these are supposed to, gosh darn it, these are supposed to be animated. This is a picture of, of, of the swamper. Uh, he rode in the front with me. I uh, got out of the coffee pot and coffee cups. There's his fire tent. You get the idea. This was on a picture. I always kind of like this picture. It was down in San Diego. I love to go to San Diego City and fight fire because this was all brand new. They, they didn't have anything even close to this. Of course, they're all big, you know, big city stuff, which is good. I mean, we need that. But, but when you bring the hand crews, it's like, man, oh, man, you know, it's just, this is quite a, quite a show, if you will, for them. So what does SA stand for? Thank you. What bit of SA is most important in the wildfire? That's actually kind of an open-ended one. What do you think? What do you think? All of it? Okay, that's a good answer. Do you think there's a list? Is there a priority list? I think there is. I do. Did I say wind was king or queen? I would say wind, seriously. But you've got to have burning conditions, you know. Uh, what, 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 one important use of cameras? Thank you very much. Uh, and what three factors influence wildland fire behavior? Fuel, weather, topography, is that what you said? I know it is. <laughs> okay. Um, pretty close, Ann. <laughs> Questions? I filled in all the gaps? <laughs> all right. Thanks, you guys. <laughs> so, Randy, on behalf of Think Trees, we want to, we want to award you this. <laughs> With this tree cookie, and we really appreciate you coming. Thank no, you. Thank you. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Oh, nice. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for, thanks for having me. How about a serious, how about a hand for the, the, all the organizers and all that? Because this is a, huh? All right. Okay. Thanks a lot.